Hello, everyone, as you come into the room. Great to see you. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. My name is Michael. I'm the events coordinator and publicist at Annie Bloom's Books. That's the virtual fiction shelf there behind me um, at my home, remote Annie Bloom's outpost. For those of you who aren't familiar with Annie Bloom's, we're located in Portland, Oregon, in the heart of Multnomah Village. We've been around for 42 years now, and we are still going strong despite everything that's going on. Our store is now open just in the last couple of weeks to limited browsing, just a few customers at a time, first come, first served. We are open on weekdays from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and weekends 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, if you, you can stop by and ask a question, you can come into the store if it's not already have a few people in there. We are uh, there to answer phones, reply to emails. We love to hear from people who are looking for recommendations and just talk about books. It's one of the things we missed most during the shutdown. So get in touch. Uh, also, our website is always open, www.annieblooms.com. You can go there day and night. We offer curbside pickup, local delivery, and various shipping options. You can go there right now to buy the book if you like. I'm going to pop that into the chat, the link for that. There you go. And we're admitting another person. Uh, we've got some great readings coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, two weeks from tonight. I have Oregon author J.T. Bushnell, whose debut novel is The Step Back. And the following night on May 14th, we have a couple of Portland area mystery authors, Mary Kaliikoa and Angela M. Sanders. That should be fun. Uh, tonight, we are delighted to be hosting Jutta Donat, whose memoir is Refugee, The Journey of an East German Woman. She'll be in conversation with her daughter, Danny Parento. After the reading, there's gonna be uh, a discussion between them. There's gonna be a Q and A session. You're welcome to type questions into the chat that Danny will read, or we'll let you uh, unmute yourselves and, and ask questions. Whatever you're most comfortable with is fine. Let me tell you about Refugee. Beginning with her childhood in East Germany of the 1940s, we follow the author on her family's dangerous flight from communism. As refugees, they moved from town to town in 1950s West Germany, finally settling north of Frankfurt, where Jutta spends her teenage years. After marrying an American intelligence officer, she emigrates to Oregon, her husband's home state. She learns about America and its customs as an outsider. Like her father, she struggles with alcoholism, eventually finding her way to recovery. After remarriage in 1989, she finds refuge at home in Portland. And I didn't mention this earlier, but signed copies of the book are available. So uh, feel free to uh, make a request for one of those. Let me tell you about Jutta Donat. Uh, obviously, I just did a little bit because it's a memoir. Uh, she was born in former East Germany, holds a master's degree in German from Portland State University. She taught German and English as a non-native English, as uh, yeah, non-native English at Portland Community College for 25 years. Yuta co-translated with her daughter, Danny, a book of Ingrid Gottschalk's German poetry, What Remains. She lives with her husband in Portland, Oregon. And Danny, who is Yuta's daughter, holds a degree in German from Portland State. She has enjoyed traveling the world with her mother since she was nine months old and hopes to be on a plane with her again very soon. Yeah, that'd be great for all of us. Formerly employed in high tech, she now lives on a small farm in Banks with her husband and 36 animals most of whom I've recently learned are chickens. All right, Yuta and Danny. Hey, Michael, one question, please. Where did, where's the gallery view? Because I don't have a- Oh, the upper right-hand corner, there's a little box and then it says view. If you click that, it'll bring up a menu. You know, if you're on speaker, then you can choose gallery instead. It does not work, so, okay. Hmm. All right, I see it, it says view up here and I would love to see and did you click that little thing that says view? Yeah. Should give you an option for speaker or gallery, but. Oh, I hope I hope it's at your end that you can make that happen for me. Maybe your husband can run downstairs and, and assist you. There you go. <laughs> He's going to have any action. <laughs> <laughs> Momentary delay. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> there's Bill. 
I would like to have the gallery view and uh, I can't see that right here. So I tried that too. Well, okay. If you can hit that little arrow. Mm -hmm, I know. did. Okay. <laughs> okay, there is. Uh, hit gallery. It was my husband who fixed this technical question. <laughs> oh, Danny. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for being here uh, tonight. It's it's uh, lovely to see so many familiar faces and uh, some new ones too. And uh, thanks, Michael, for making this uh, reading possible tonight. Um, Annie Blooms has been my bookstore for, for decades and it's almost within walking distance from my house. So I would uh, also like to thank uh, Windfall Press for publishing this book and uh, my editors, Michael McDowell and Bill Siverly. Uh, and a big, big uh, thank you goes to uh, uh, Friederike Hoyer who created this wonderful uh, piece of art, which is the cover of the book. And uh, I would also uh, like to thank from the bottom of my heart, to thank my daughter Daniela uh, that she can be with us here tonight and to participate and uh, as we go on I guess Daniela we continue to make memories. <laughs> yeah. Hi mom. <laughs> <laughs> Hi daughter. <laughs> Uh, thanks for inviting me tonight. This is this is very exciting for anyone that hasn't seen the book yet. I don't even know is it does it look backwards to everybody. It is a beautiful cover. She just uh, thanked her friend Frederica. It's a gorgeous book, and it just it just is amazing. It's I think for for our family, it's just been a, a profound experience to see this this come to light. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, what Michael said about the Q&A. Please don't hesitate to um, uh, type in your any questions you have into the chat bar when when she's finished her reading tonight. I would love to read them or you, I'll call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask them yourself. It would be nice just to be able to connect a little bit with her listeners. And I know she would love to love to interact with you guys a little bit before the night is over. Um, so, yeah. So there, well, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Have to say okay. So, guest, Daniela, we have one guest here tonight from Görlitz, Germany. That is Julia Gottschalk. <laughs> she got up at four o'clock this morning to be <laughs> part of this reading. Hi, Julia. So, uh, Mom, Yuta, I'm going to try to call you Yuta tonight, just to eliminate any naming confusion um, for the listeners. But if I if I slip up and call you Mom, you'll still answer, right? <laughs> I'm I'm really excited to be here. We've done we've done projects before together, but this is our first uh, Zoom uh, call in this kind of setting. So I'm I'm hoping it it goes smoothly. Um, I've been thinking a lot about our conversation tonight, and as your daughter. I think I mentioned it a little bit. It's it, witnessing the process of you writing this memoir has been uh, a lot of fun. It's been an incredible experience. Uh, we got to spend an, a lot of time together, um, and then of course during Zoom we spent a lot of time together on the during Zoom during COVID we spent a lot of time together on the phone. But I think the, the the feeling that I'm taking away from this is we made memories as you were reflecting on your own memories, and that's that's one of the greatest gifts for me. Is 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 it's just been a lovely experience. Um, if I think back, it was I want to say it was more than ten years ago when I first started receiving emails from you with short story uh, memories, you know, uh, that you would send to me and. Um, it, it, this was the earliest stages of your book, I realize now, and um, I loved getting those emails. It, it feels like it, it was quite a while though, uh, it, in between those short stories and when you actually started talking about writing a memoir. Um, do you recall actually when, those, when your memories that you were just kind of sort of playing with became a memoir in your mind? Yes, I think that was, uh... In 2016, we decided to uh, go to my hometown in the former East Germany 
and uh, stay there for a quarter of a year, which is also three months, and uh, just devote ourselves to nothing but writing and me uh, doing extra research. And that's when I that's when I knew that it would become a memoir. Yeah. Um, you, the, your memories dovetail um, with an incredibly historic time, you know, a, a period of history. What kind of research did you do for your book? Hmm. Well, most of the research I did, of course, was uh, done with my German books and uh, then actually research also in, in, in Görlitz proper when we were there. And uh, we had all kinds of adventures uh, uh, in, in finding, I think that's not in the book, by the way, there are a few, few things that are not in the book, but being in Görlitz uh, really, really, uh, helped get the memoir together and uh, actually going to see my the house that I was born in and uh, trying to remember the way it used to be. And all of these things just really helped, helped me to form uh, the memoir. I recall you telling me something about your, your mom being reluctant to share uh, memories with you and you actually had to go to another source. Yes, uh, my mom would always like to talk about the Schweitzer family, her family, and I got all kinds of anecdotes from her, but uh, the, the really uh, important information I uh, got from my sister Ingrid, and uh, she uh, has been in my life since the day I was born, and uh, she uh, is responsible for my going back to school and uh, uh, she's also been the my anchor so to speak and and the magnet that we all keep going back to Berlitz and uh, uh, when she died that was a that was a big 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 loss um, I think tonight is the fourth opportunity that you've had to read from and, and discuss your memoir with, with others. And you've started receiving feedback from your readers. Um, I'm appreciating how your memoir is resonating with people on so many different levels. Um, the themes that you address in, in your book, what, what happened to you, um, are, are, are powerful themes, yeah, family separation, loneliness, uh, uh, being in recovery or struggling to find it, and the, the eternal quest for the, the sense of home. Um, have you been surprised by the reaction that you're getting from people who've been emotionally affected by your by your book? I really have because they were all different uh, reactions. Uh, some people commented on the loneliness that was a thread throughout the book, um, and as a little girl in particular. Some people really, really felt connected to that. Um, other people had personal uh, feelings about my father, for example, or uh, or my brother who was always teasing me. So it, it, you know, all these examples of that happened to people in in their own lives, and uh, and it was really fascinating to, to see what people read into the book, brought to the book. Yeah. Um. I was wondering whether I would I would ask you this. Um, was it difficult for you to share your story of, of alcoholism and, and your struggle to find uh, uh, recovery? I gave it a lot of thought. I at first uh, I was not going to include that part of my life, but <laughs> looking back, it is such an enormous part of my life and of the lives of my family. Um, I decided to go ahead and do that, and uh, I, I sincerely hope that it might even give some people some hope. Which makes me wonder, did the process of writing this, whether it be from when you were a child or even, you know, discussing uh, your recovery, did it bring up any unresolved issues for you or, or uh, did it help you understand aspects of your life that maybe you hadn't previously addressed? No, it seems like there were no surprises. It just uh, uh, made some of these memories uh, stronger. I kind of lingered over certain aspects for hours while I was sitting at the computer. 
Um, but I can't say that there were any surprises or that there was anything unresolved in my life. Uh, you, you mentioned it a little bit um, that, about your sister. Um, you dedicate this book to her. Was there anything else that you wanted to, to, to share about, about her? Oh, yeah. She, uh, she, I, I think Michael mentioned that. We uh, translated a book of poems uh, of hers, Daniela and I did, and uh, we were able to go to Germany after publication of the book and uh, uh, read it in the community that she was in. And uh, it, it was very, very uh, touching. And it felt a little bit like I could pay her back for this incredible support and love that she's given me all, all my life. I, I, I remember that day very well because up until that point, she had been almost bored with us telling her what we were doing and showing her the book and all of this. And that day in her and her facility in the assisted care facility, she was just so proud the way that she, you know, sat in the front and looked around to see who was who was joining to hear you read from her book. It was it was an unexpected, you know, experience. Um, August 2019 was your last trip to Germany, and then, you know, the COVID kind of shut down the world. Uh, I know we're all dreaming of being able to travel again soon. Uh, how is it going to feel to go home again? Yeah, in uh, August of 2019, as usual, we were planning on uh, celebrating my brother's birthday, which uh, was on the uh, 24th of August, and it was a very important birthday namely the 85th. But then uh, COVID happened and we couldn't travel. And uh, then I lost my brother to COVID uh, this January. And uh, Germany isn't going to be the same. Görlitz isn't going to be the same without my big brother. Yeah. Well. All right. Um, I know you've selected painstakingly the passages that you wanted to read tonight. Is there anything that you want to mention before you begin reading or are you ready to just kind of begin with the first one? Well, I kind of, I'm kind of ready. Thank you, thank you for your questions. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to begin by reading about my earliest uh, memory. Um, it's uh, 1945, uh, World War II is still raging and allied bombs are falling close to my hometown in Görlitz. Görlitz basically it was spared by the bombs themselves, but all around us, uh, especially Dresden and, and uh, wonderful cities like that uh, were hit hard. But we could see the, the explosions and we could see the lights and we could see the, the, the flak splinters flying around. And uh, so this is one of my earliest uh, memories. Frightening sounds. Whenever sirens started to wail in Görlitz in 1945, my family fled into the cellar of our house. My earliest memories are of those nights. As I was carried in my baby bed down two flights of stairs across the courtyard into the coal cellar, the light blue canopy over my crib swayed back and forth. Candles flickered along the coal black walls as we went down into the cold and musty stone cellar. My mother's soothing voice would always try to calm me. When World War II ended, I was three years old. For the last two years of the war, Germany was mainly in retreat and allied air power ruled the skies. My hometown of Görlitz was almost completely spared by the allied attacks. A few bombs fell at the outskirts of the city doing little damage. But the alarm almost always happened during the night. The sound of the wailing air raid alarm, the Flieger alarm, was piercing, and my mother told me that I often started to cry. Many years later, in a yoga class, I would ask the teacher to please turn off the background music with its series of high repetitive tones, because it brought back memories of being carried into that stone cellar during an air raid. Other students experienced the sounds as relaxing, but I heard high-pitched Flieger alarm and cried. Mm 
in the year is still 1945 and uh, filled with events in Görlitz and around uh, Görlitz that were uh, gruesome and dangerous. And uh, uh, the, the Allied bombings were increasing and the Russians were advancing. So um, my father feared for our, for our um, safety. And uh, so I'd like to quickly read this uh, Fleeing the City. On February 17th, 1945, Five days after the firebombing of Dresden, my parents, my sister Ingrid, and my brother Peter and I fled to Auer, a small town located in the southwestern part of the state of Silesia. Since Auer was 211 kilometers from Görlitz, safety from air raids and advancing Russian army seemed possible to my parents. The trip was slow and treacherous with low-flying enemy aircraft overhead. As we drove to Auer in my father's Hanumat, a German car produced in the 20s and 30s, Allied planes roared over us. Several times my father pulled the car off the road into the forest to hide from the threatening enemy planes. He quickly decided it would be safer to spend our first night in Schönau, a rural community only 16 kilometers from Görlitz. My parents had previously arranged temporary housing for us in a hotel in Auer, belonging to Frau Schimanda, a friend of the family. When we arrived, my father escorted us into the hotel, wished us a safe stay, and drove back to Görlitz. My sister thought of the weeks in Auer as carefree and safe, it was filled with plenty of food. She even had a crush on one of the young men there. But when the Deutsche Wehrmacht began to flee from the approaching Russian army, German soldiers crossed through our discarding guns, rifles, grenades, and even insignia from their uniforms. My brother remembers watching the fleeing men as they tossed those items over a wall. The following day, he and another 10-year-old decided to explore what the soldiers had thrown behind the wall. It was Peter's turn to babysit me that day, so he sat me on top of that stone wall. The boys climbed over it and began to explore. Peter and his friend tossed grenades back and forth like footballs, examined revolvers and other weapons, and collected swastika insignia. Many of the medals were buried under old movie reels, flags, and propaganda booklets. When he finally took me off the wall to go back to the hotel, he had gathered an entire carton full of insignia and medals. Over the next weeks, my mother made her way back to Görlitz several times to be with my father. She hitchhiked along dangerous roads, never knowing which army she might encounter or who it was that she hitchhiked with. Fearing one of the low-flying fighter planes would drop bombs on the road, she would scramble into a ditch or tall grass. My father remained in Görlitz and continued to run the business with his father and younger brother, Fritz. It is uh, 1948 now, and uh, Görlitz is overrun by refugees from the other side of the uh, Odenaise River. Uh, my hometown is now after the war, after 1945, divided by the river. Uh, the west side is uh, Germany and the east side is now Poland. So it is 1948 and the war is over and I'm uh, five years old. People are starving in Görlitz. And uh, I remember this particular uh, uh, gathering of food, I should say. In tin milk cans. My family still employed household help because there, aren't, there weren't any other jobs available for our employees. The great food shortage continued and people were roaming the streets in search of food or firewood. By 1948, half of Gallet's school children were considered undernourished and thousands experienced hunger. Since I was still a small child, my family received a block of tiny green rationing stamps for milk, for me, whenever it was available in the city. When our maid, Frau Gabe, and I went to the stores, 
I was allowed to carefully tear off each little stamp, a difficult task for my tiny fingers. Frau Galbe would carry two large tin milk cans, one for milk and the other for broth. The one for broth always looked larger and newer to me and didn't have any dents. I wasn't always allowed to go with her on these trips. I looked forward to these outings, but my mother always said that I could go along if I didn't look too peaked. She always worried that I looked too pale. When my mother wasn't looking, I pinched my cheeks to make them look red and healthy. At the milk store, Frau Garbe would let me hand in the green rationing stamps for the milk, which always looked very thin, almost watery. But the milk store itself smelled wonderful. It even smelled a little bit like cheese, which I loved. Milk wasn't always available, and we often returned home with an empty can. But the, when there was no milk to be had, the milk can was never filled full. So sometimes, I'm sorry, but when there was milk to be had, the milk can was never filled full. So sometimes I was allowed to carry it. I felt proud and tried hard not to spill a drop. One day I did stumble over a cobblestone and a tiny bit of milk was sp spilled. But Frau Garbe didn't scold me. Don't be sad, she told me, stroking my hair. The rest of the way home, I carried the milk can with both hands and close to my chest. I could smell the faint aroma of the milk and imagine the wonderful puddings Frau Garbe would make with it. I remember there, the vanilla puddings. There was never such a thing as a chocolate pudding. There was no chocolate to be had. Um, now I'd like to tell you what happened in 1952. Uh, I'm five years old and uh, this is just before we were forced to flee my hometown of Görlitz. The night the lights went out. The streets were dark and icy that night and not many people were on Berliner Straße. Snow was falling heavily, making the streets almost impassable. All three of us were surprised to hear the doorbell ring. Family or friends who came to visit knew to ring the doorbell twice. But just now the bell rang without stopping. I ran to the door and opened it cautiously. In the dim light of the staircase, four men in long black leather coats stood in front of our door. They were wearing high black boots and all four of them wore gray hats, which they had pulled down over their faces. They pushed their way by me and through the door without taking off their hats. The tallest of the four men shouted, is dein Vater zu Hause? I answered that yes, my father was at home. I didn't know why he shouted because the house was very quiet. He leaned down and put his hand under my chin and looked into my face. I hated it when people did that. Besides, his eyes frightened me. He smelled of cigars and sweat. Before he turned away, he pinched my cheek and patted me on the head. I hated that even more. I told them that my parents were in the Herrenzimmer, the room usually reserved for my father and his men friends. But this was also the room where we would all sit when my parents had company. Without knocking, the men entered the Herrenzimmer. My mother was leaning forward in her small cane back chair with the book still on her lap. My father got up out of his chair and stretched out his hand to greet the visitors, but the tallest of the four did not shake my father's hand. Instead, he said, Volkspolizei, and added that he had orders to search the home. The Volkspolizei, the VP, was the much feared East German police. My father asked in an unsteady voice why our home had to be searched by the police. The man barked that he did not have to give any reasons and removed his coat. I noticed many colorful medals on his jacket and tried to count them, but he turned and ordered the other men to search desks, closets, drawers, and chests in every room. My mother waved me over to her and lifted me onto her lap. Her hands were ice cold. She pulled me close to her and wrapped her arms around me. 
we both watched my father pace back and forth. He told the men he'd be glad to help and assured them that he had nothing to hide. The men ignored him. Just then, one of the men pulled a stack of papers from our big book cabinet where my mother kept her correspondence in a drawer. She tried to jump out of her chair, but I was still on her lap. She lifted me off and stepped toward the man. I stayed close behind her, hanging onto her skirt. Meine Briefe, she said in a shaky voice. The man took a pocket knife from his coat and slid open the pink ribbon that held the papers together. The policeman saw that there were letters and wanted to know what kind of letters they were. My mother held out her hands. Liebesbriefe von meinem Mann. She implored him to give back the love letters from her husband. The man looked at her, threw the letters back into the cabinet and walked away. My mother's whole body trembled when she reached for the letters. The other men opened and closed doors and drawers down the hall. I heard them enter my room and open the cabinets and drawers. What about my doll, Elizabeth, my books, my new ballet slippers? Would they take those away from me? Now the tall policeman walked over to my father's desk and began to open it. He pulled out the drawers and started shuffling through the top drawer. I could see the vein on my father's temple bulging. That was his private desk and no one had permission to open it. He took a step toward his desk, but my mother put her hand on his arm. My father stopped and put his hand over my mother's. All of a sudden, the lights went out. This happened often in the early evening hours. It was called Stromsperre, an intentional blackout. The newspaper had announced that blackouts would help save electricity. Now we all stood in the dark. The other men were coming back to the sitting room and stumbling and cursing. Fräulein Marta had stayed in the kitchen, but now she came in with a candle and placed it on my father's desk. The candlelight made me feel a little safer. Fräulein Marta straightened her apron and looked at my father. She looked frightened. My father told her she could leave. She looked at my mother and me. She pulled out a handkerchief of her apron pocket and held it to her eyes. Then she turned around and ran down the dark corridor. Everything was very quiet. The tall policeman turned to my father and bellowed that he would be back at 7 a.m. the next morning. My father replied sternly that they were welcome to come back anytime since he had absolutely nothing to hide. The man was still standing at my father's desk and said that they'd have to seal the desk until the next morning. He reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a dark red stick. He held it over the candle on the desk until it began to drip. The drips formed a red lake, which the man let flow over the edge of the desktop and over the closed door. Then he pulled out a metal stamp out of his pocket and pushed it hard into the hot liquid. When he pulled the stamp out in fast hardening red stream, it had made a deep official looking design. The man checked everything carefully and stepped back looked at my father and told him that he was forbidden to open his desk. He turned, grabbing his black leather coat and walked out of the room. His men followed. They pulled their hats even lower over their faces and pulled up the lapels of their leather coats. Our big wooden entry door slammed shut and heavy boots stomped down the stone stairs. So by the year 1959, uh, we had lived in West Germany for a while. And uh, I am now preparing for my very first trip home to Galitz, to East Germany, uh, to visit my sister. My parents were terribly nervous about me making this trip, but um, I wasn't nervous at all. Uh, I was looking forward to adventure and excitement, and uh, I was 16. I was fearless. So this is uh, my just a, a short uh, 
glimpse into what it was like to what was needed in East Germany and what some people were able to bring them. A suitcase of contraband. Ingrid applied for a visa for me at the Görlitz police station and two weeks later, she needed to know if my application had been accepted or denied. Driving to the police station, she knew that it would be a difficult, uneasy visit. She hated the long corridors with closed doors on either side. Chairs were lined up against the walls and almost always apprehensive looking people would be waiting to be called into one of the rooms. There was good news for my sister though. She was told by one of the police women that the application for my visa was finally approved. The state apparently did not hold me responsible for quote, the foolish decision the child's parents had made in leaving East Germany, unquote. The official later had told her. In the letter Ingrid sent me, she included a visa application to be filled out in quadruplicate. With my mother's help, I completed the forms the same day and returned them to, my, to Ingrid. In the next letter, Ingrid asked in our secret code for certain items that I should bring with me if I could. Our family had practiced codes, usually using fictitious family members. For example, Ingrid would talk about poor Aunt Lucy who had developed diabetes. With that, our family in the West understood that insulin was needed for Dieter's patients. Although there was a shortage of in, in insulin for diabetics in Gallitz, it was strictly forbidden to import pharmaceuticals of any kind. And Dieter always asked for medical journals so he could keep up with medical developments in the West. Is Uncle Herbert still reading as much? Might have been the code. We were acquainted with physicians in the West who would gladly donate these and other items. East Germany considered all written material, books, journals, newspapers, and magazines as dangerous capitalist material and therefore not permitted. These requests presented a challenge of where to hide all the written material and medications I was collecting in my suitcases. I decided not to tell my mother about the contents of my two very large suitcases. Ingrid also asked for West money, a currency East Germans were not allowed to have. However, it would buy many Western items in the Intershop, a series of government run retail stores where only hard currency was accepted. East Germans were not permitted to shop at the Intershop, but it quietly opened the door to those who were fortunate enough to show that they were able to pay with West money. High quality goods, which were not available in East Germany, could be purchased there. Primarily, my sister shopped there for West coffee, chocolate, cigarettes, and even stylish clothing. All proceeds, of course, would go to the East German government. West money would also be necessary to use in bribing East German officials to overlook some of her activities, like refusing to vote in elections. Ingrid also needed it in hotels and restaurants to receive special treatment by the front desk or the maitre d' in restaurants. If one could afford it, using West money was a widespread illegal practice for survival under communism. The money would have to be hidden on my body under my clothing, and I planned on wearing several layers. When my parents weren't quite able to afford the train ticket to Görlitz, I added my small savings, but it still wasn't enough. My mother suggested I'd ask my uncle Rudel in Hamburg, who gladly contributed the rest of the money. The last piece I would like uh, to, to share with you um, is <laughs> in 1962, and many things have happened. Uh, I got married in Germany to an American soldier, and uh, we were traveling to his hometown in uh, Oregon, Klamath Falls, after we had arrived in New York. We had a car and we drove it across the United States in four days. 
uh, I'm talking about here where I'm about to meet my in-laws for the first time, and I have no idea what to expect. Klamath Falls. When we got to the city limits of Klamath Falls, I asked Jim to stop at a gas station so that I could freshen up. I found it interesting that gas stations in America offered restrooms for travelers. German gas stations did not provide the service. Again, I smelled pine saw cleaner, which seemed to be everywhere. I splashed cold water on my face, and when I looked into the cracked mirror, I saw how tired and pale I looked. I reached into my purse and pulled out my black eyeliner. I refreshed the smudges contours of my eyelids and that seemed to lessen the fatigue in my face. The thought of meeting Jim's parents in a few moments made my knees weak and I felt dizzy. I leaned against the cold tiles of the bathroom wall and closed my eyes until the dizziness subsided. As we drove into Klamath Falls, I couldn't believe my eyes. The town looked like a movie set for a Western. The hills around the city were a strange mixture of beige, brown, and yellow. As a child, I had read all the books of Karl May, a German writer who was fascinated by the West in the 1800s. In my imagination, I saw the famous characters appear over the hills on horses, and I remembered their adventures in the Wild West. When we reached Jim's childhood home on Pacific Terrace, I was surprised to see that it was actually surrounded by tall trees and that green lawns spread out in front of every house on the street. His house was white with green awnings and steps leading up to the front porch. The lawn was bright green and freshly mown. I had seen neighborhoods just like this one in movies. We parked the car. Jim grasped my hand to lead me up the front steps. He rang the doorbell and Jim's mother, a diminutive older lady, greeted us. Behind her stood my father-in-law, a tall, jovial-looking man in his late 60s. They both shook my hand and embraced their son. My in-laws, Fred and Ruth, urged us to bring in our luggage quickly. Jim and I wondered why we had to get our bags quickly but we pulled the suitcases out of our VW, VW bug and carried them up the front steps. We can sit and chat later, said Fred, but right now we should get downtown to watch the big 4th of July parade. I had no idea what Fred, whom I later called dad, was talking about, but I was curious. Ruth had already gone down the steps wearing a small summery hat and clutching a white purse. She slid onto the front seat of Fred's shiny new Cadillac. Jim and I climbed into the back and I marveled at the enormous car with its motor humming almost inaudibly. From the driver's seat, Fred shouted, can't get up Main Street because the parade has already started. I'll park on the side street here and we'll walk up to my office building, the medical dental building, just two streets away. They're all right with you, mother? He asked his wife. Ruth nodded and smiled. Loud marching music was coming up Main Street as we entered the building. Fred's accounting office was on the third floor. Right next to the elevator door stood a large, shiny brass container. What is that? I asked. Why, that's a spittoon, honey, and a nice one, too. Fred smiled when he realized that I had no idea what that meant. Men get to spit in it so they won't spit in the elevator or offices. A rotund man with a big cowboy hat and a cigar in his mouth joined us at the elevator. He took the cigar out of his mouth and spat into the spittoon in a perfect arc. Before putting the cigar back into his mouth, he turned to us and said, Howdy, folks. Then we all squeezed into the elevator. I was pushed against the man with the big belly and the putrid smell of his cigar made me almost gag. I tried to turn my face away, but the smell was overpowering. When we finally arrived on the third floor, the fat man hollered, now you all have a dandy day. That's all I'm going to read tonight. That's great. That's nice.
um, I wanted to mention that if anyone is interested in learning more about the history of Germany and specifically uh, the history of the German Democratic Republic, Bill, Jutta's husband, um, is able to recommend a couple of books that I'll put in the chat. And Michael Keefe also has, will have um, the information. You, uh, Annie Blooms has them on their site. They are a special order, but I'll just paste those in right now. And um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? If so, you're welcome to unmute, or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can put them in the text. Um, if there aren't any questions, Mom, I might, Yuta, I might tag you again and have you read another passage, but um, just give a moment if anybody has anything that they want to ask. Well, I'll ask one. Uh, what was the process like for uh, getting out of East Germany uh, at some point there in the 50s? I noticed there was a transition. Yeah, uh, the wall wasn't up yet. The wall was erected uh, on the 13th of August, 1961. So in 1952, um, people were still able to uh, get across the border uh, carefully, or um, in our case, uh, it was a uh, it was a different story. So that's that's about two chapters in my book. <laughs> well, I don't I'll spoil just, that. I'll just say that with the help of the underground, uh, we were able to get out of Gelnitz. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, Aiden, I see your hand yes. up. Yeah. Um, so my question is. Uh, what is something unexpected that you either learned during the process of writing the book or that ended up in the book that you're happy about? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a big question. We should have asked for these questions in advance, huh, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> Would have been better. <laughs> this is now the gotcha section okay. where like, I'm actually trying to get content for my talk show. Courtesy, courtesy of Yuta's grandson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess it was unexpected and, and, and it made me very, very happy that my family supported me in every way that they could, every way they could. And actually, Aiden, I have a photo of you in the corner of my computer as I'm talking to you. And uh, so my whole family uh, cheered me on and uh, were uh, excited when, when the books arrived from the printer in January. Your friend Josephine Lindell said, thank you, Yuta. This has been such a treat. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my Hi, name Kacha. is Kat <laughs> Katja Wee. I am um, I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm the cousin. Um, I just wanted to say um, how remarkable your book is. I am so um, impressed because I had very similar experience. So I can identify with all your emotions and um, fears initially, and then a culture shock. And um, one thing that I wanted to ask you, uh, Miss Donut, is do, are you afraid of fireworks? No, I'm not afraid of fireworks, but as I mentioned, I, I am really, uh, I guess, still afraid of high-pitched noises because of the fliege mm -hmm. alarm of the, the air raids. Yeah. Okay, because I also experienced um, similar things, as I said, and, and today, you know, the fireworks still remind me Mm -hmm. um, even after so many years, those memories yeah. still can be uh, brought back. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how, how so sounds in particular can haunt us the rest of our lives. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, did you have a question? Yes. You do. Tell us, tell me more about choosing the title of the book. 
<laughs> yeah. Mary, the title of the book, it went through several uh, stages. And uh, I finally arrived at this stage, probably by, you know, discussing it and talking it over with, with my editors. And, uh, but eventually I, I figured that I, the whole book uh, describes uh, a flight from or a flight into something. Yeah. So I thought refugee would be uh, appropriate. I was only signaling you because your microphone was uh, blocked for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So are there moments now that you, you feel sort of more, still like a refugee more than other moments? Uh, yeah, it, yes, I, I guess, and especially when I was writing the book, I felt like I was slipping right back into the little girl. And as we left uh, Galitz and didn't belong anywhere and uh, traveled from city to city to city to city. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that that's is... probably something that'll stay with me and yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mom, didn't you have, you had a conversation at one point about how oh, being sure. a refugee is a lifelong thing. It's not something that's not an act. It's not a momentary thing. It's a lifelong uh, part of who you are then. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I believe that no matter in how uh, adjusted, how successful, how at home you feel in your new country, you will always be right. a refugee. I, agree. I will always be a refugee. Um, I asked my brother if what he thought about that. And he said, oh, that's clear to me. I will always be a refugee. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Her brother's name is Peter too. Um, Sharon Wood Wortman said, Yuta and Danny, thank you. A great mother daughter journey story as well. Inspiring. I missed hearing what Yuta's father did for a living. Would you repeat the last part, please? Uh, she, uh, so Sharon would like to know what your dad did for a living. Ah, uh, he uh, worked with his brother in my grandfather's. Uh, large company, a moving company, storage company, and all kinds of other things. He distributed beer and uh, it's a, it was a huge undertaking. And my dad simply was the son of the owner, actually had never had a job by himself or had gotten a job by himself. So it, um, moving to West Germany and trying to find uh, a job was extremely difficult for him. Um, Tom, May I ask? Go ahead. Sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Um, Mrs. Donna, do you feel that being refugee in United States is different? than being a refugee in other places? Hmm. <laughs> well, it, it, I would imagine it, it uh, depends on what decade we're in. Uh, if, if you're talking about today's uh, situation, it would be different. But being in another country, I. I was never a refugee in another country. So I, I imagine that is something that you experienced, Katja. Yes. Okay. No, I'm muted. Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, I did. Um, I felt finally when I became a citizen of the United States, I felt that was my other home. So I was just wondering if you, if you felt that way. I just felt that way because I feel, well, everybody here 
is from somebody else and has perhaps stories similar like you and me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that makes it feel more like at home. Right, right, right. Yeah. Katja, does that mean that the first place that you arrived once you left Bosnia, it was not a similar experience? I realized you didn't stay there as long, but you did spend some time. My personal information is that you wound up someplace else first. Yes, correct. And um, that was, I, I had a refugee visa and it was only temporary. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Tom Hogan, mom says, thank you, Yuta and Danny, for a wonderful reading. You made the book come alive. Yes. Thank you, Tom. That's nice. Gosh, this worked out really well. We're at 7.56. We have four minutes left to fill. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that someone has one more question to ask. <laughs> yes, Tegan. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm interested in... Um, the middle portion of the book after you're already married, but before the wall has come down, uh, the sense I get uh, while reading was that um, our family had kind of a casually revolutionary attitude when it came to the GBR. And I'm interested if that was um, typical, if that was just like what was required to survive at that time was to get outside help or if um, that was atypical for folks living uh, in East Germany at that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, um, I think I mentioned briefly that my, my sister, for example, went, refused to go to East German elections. And when she was asked why she was doing that, uh, she said, well, you give me a choice and then I'll come. Basically, there were like four parties on paper, but they all went into one pot. So we had that revolutionary spirit uh, coming, coming to see them and bringing all these things that were forbidden and keeping them alive spiritually, morally, you know, telling them that they're not forgotten. Uh, we couldn't tell them this will be over soon. Uh, no one expected it you know, to be over uh, in 1989, um, it was a big surprise. And, uh, but yeah, we, we kept, we kept, uh, kept it alive with our East German family and East German friends. And uh, I think that made a difference. Tegan brings an interesting question to my mind, though. Do, did you know of other families that were in similar circumstances that were doing the same thing? Was any of that information ever given to you? I feel like I never, I don't know any stories of anyone else doing this. I'm sure there must have been, obviously. You know, there were many, many examples of families from the West that were divided and had people in the East. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and some people were able to just simply disappear out of East Germany and wind, winding up in, in West Germany somewhere. And, uh, and we as a family always thought there some dark things going on uh, that uh, it was not, let's say it wasn't legal. And uh, people probably had something to do with the Communist Party and therefore were protected at the borders and that's that was our idea anyway yeah um we have one more comment that came in from from greg smiley he said aside from what you give to us via this book i wish to honor your efforts of creation finding home is a lifelong process at least for me i hope someday we can focus less on where we started and more on where we are i only received my book today more to come but always honor our past. We are all the years that we live. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Were there any other questions? Yeah, I have one more process question. <laughs> um, so like for a project this big, you, you know, you've obviously learned so much um, throughout. Uh, what, um, what would you want to tell yourself at the beginning of this project, having experienced its entirety? At the beginning of the uh, 
Excuse what would you tell the you that's about to start writing this book now, having finished writing the book? Oh, having finished writing the book. You know, I, I, expected, I expected to be incredibly happy and jumping up and down for finally having finished the book and, and having it in front of me. But you know, funny thing, I, I wasn't. I was very calm and pleased and thought a lot about my sister and my brother. And, uh, but it surprised me that I didn't just jump up and down with joy. So, but that, that is basically also the way I think the book ends, uh, that something was complete. So, yeah. Well, I'm just so grateful that all of you joined tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Danny and Jutta, for sharing this. This was really wonderful to hear the reading, and so great to get your questions from, um, from each other and to talk, hear the talk. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. The, uh, the recording uh, will be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow, sometime in the afternoon. So uh, feel free to share that with folks who weren't able to make it or watch the whole thing again. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a really good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.